a very warm welcome to Talking Europe. French and German defence ministers have released plans for a European Defence Union, one that would set up a new military headquarters, have battle groups ready for deployment and have an EU budget. The head of the EU Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, has in the past said the bloc needs an EU army in order to be taken seriously at an international level. Closer cooperation on defence has the backing of many member states, including Hungary and the Czech Republic. The strongest critic of an army, the UK, has of course voted to leave the EU. But other countries who staunchly oppose remain. Ireland, for one, has voiced its disapproval. So are EU member states moving closer to forming an EU army? How possible is this and what are the pros and cons? Well, to help us dissect it all, we are joined by Jacek Sariusz-Wolski, a Polish MEP with the European People's Party. Beside you, we have Liani Rieda, Irish MEP, uh, sitting in Europe with the Confederal Group of the European United Left. And on the opposite side of the table, we have Major General Philippe Sommer. Uh, you've worked with NATO in the past and also were part of Eurocorps, this uh, grouping of uh, a number of EU national armies. So let me start first with not perhaps the idea of the EU army, but what we've heard a lot about this week, a plan notably pitched by German and French defence ministers of this common European defence. It sounds like it's getting close to an EU army. Uh, Miss Nureda, how do you see the current plans for a common EU defence? Are we getting towards an army? I think it's quite alarming and I think it's quite frightening that if we are moving towards that, it's something that we in Sinn Féin and that I hope the Irish government will vigorously oppose. Obviously Ireland has had a neutral stance for many, many years and we would like to keep that. It's also quite worrying to think that they would pull on articles previously unused in the Lisbon Treaty to try and invoke this. Uh, so I think we have to be very mindful, we have to oppose this vigorously. Um, so I think we are in a very critical state in the EU itself and with Brexit that's going to have massive uh, ramifications for all of us but particularly for Ireland and therefore it is indeed a very worrying time for us in Ireland and we will have to uphold our neutrality at all costs. Mr. Zarius Wolski, uh, Ireland perhaps in the minority in the EU now in countries being opposed to this EU army, Where, how do you feel? Well we are in favour of a uh, defence union or European uh, defence capabilities as a pillar of NATO, it's important to stress that and the recent proposal by France and Germany is a good uh, step in the right direction, although very insufficient, because it's just about uh, transportation, medical assistance, and logistics, and uh, border policing, and only south. I want to recall that once upon a time, uh, Juncker said about uh, European army to deter Russia. It looks like that Franco-German proposal is uniquely uh, directed towards the south, it completely ignores the challenges of security the most serious Europe faces, which is East, which is threat from Russia. So it is a good step, but uh, not exactly what is expected. It should be completed by Eastern dimension and by effective military power rather than policing function. Uh, Major Samir, you know, you served with the Eurocorps, which brings together military from France, Germany, I believe, Italy, Luxembourg. Is that not already an EU army? Yes, again, 2008. Don't forget the Treaty of Lisbon. In July 2008, the parliamentarians decided to call the Eurocorps. It's not with the Italian, it, was, it is between France, Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg and Spain and maybe in a close future, Poland, Poland too. And they decided to, to set up this Oroco as a standing force at the disposal for the European defense. We are mistaking sometimes European defense and the defense of Europe. It's quite different. I would ha like to come in there just on a, purely on a monetary scale. I was reading up about the Stockholm International Peace Resource Re Research Institute and they have come out saying that there's been an increase. We now spend 1.5 trillion globally on military and defence. And when you put that in the context then of the extraordinary humanitarian crisis that we have, I don't think throwing more money at this is going to resolve it. Look at how we spend in Europe, for instance, the money on Frontex. They are supposed to be border control. They are supposed to be pulling people out of the waters of the Mediterranean, something they don't. It, a lot of people say that an EU army would have that role, that we now have Frontex doing this external border security. Is that overstepping the marks of other institutions already involved? Or no, I think it's a, it's a useful com uh, compliment. Uh, because we, we are not uh, effective enough. 
but it needs to be wider. And on the whole, is the EU spending more or less on defence today than no, in the past? EU is alarmingly yes. spending uh, too little. We are free riding on America. 70% of expenditure by NATO is US. Uh, so only uh, three countries in Europe, in European Union, spend as much as they should at least, which is 2%. Is Greece, Poland, and Great Britain. Others are free riding and are spending much, much less. So we should spend more, not less. But yet, uh, Major General Sommer, the, the number of countries in the EU, there's something like 22 EU countries are in NATO. So again, is this not redundant? Are we not duplicating mm. institutions? Uh, NATO and an EU army, is that okay. not a duplication? This is the main problem. When new nations joined uh, the European Union, the first initiative they took was to join first NATO. And nations so said, okay, both? what would you have to pay both for NATO and European Union and European defense? And the British UK, in this concept, in this, in this environment, was always stopping down, slowing down uh, any, uh, any initiative or progress to, to, to improve, to, to foster this initiative of, of this uh, the European defense. And this is the reason why oh, I yeah, said it can today, be duplicated and that won't we play will well always with NATO. Improve, I mean, surely yes. NATO won't be happy with this mm. decision. No, we, we will not have uh, within a country, France or Poland, part of the army which is uh, <laughs> NATO related and part which is European defense. That's absurd. Uh, this is a false dilemma whether it should be complement or should, be, should, be, should substitute NATO. It should be a European pillar of NATO. We should spend more and should be closely uh, linked and harmonized with NATO and used whenever NATO as such is neither willing nor able to act. Is that also because of the UK stepping away, the UK which was the second biggest military might in the e European Union, uh, that makes the EU's presence in NATO perhaps uh, less strong? Ms. Nurida, do you think that's maybe a worry for our own security in the EU? I, I think again coming back to the economic factor, I know that there was other research done by the Dutch campaign against arms and they were saying that a lot of the military spending actually contributed to the uh, EU austerity and the crisis that we have and I think we should always remember why we became part of Europe in the first place. We were originally became part of Europe obviously as trading partners but also to promote peace and stability and so the idea that we're moving away from that into this kind of military blockade in my view goes against what we were originally meant to be doing. Uh, security is about defending against aggression for that you need an army uh, and you have to pay for that. Do you envisage uh, what the term has been coined a Schengen of defence, that some EU countries will move forward with this plan and other EU countries won't? It may be flexible. Uh, very often in EU we have been moving through this uh, way of that some gather and do things together and others join later. If, if not for this method, we wouldn't have Schengen itself and we wouldn't have uh, EMU and others, I mean, monetary union. So I think it's a good way to encourage, I mean, to respect the neutrality principles of some countries, but to build our own uh, capacity, but still not a com in competition with NATO, but in complementarity with NATO and facing the real challenge, which is security and aggression. Because why, why EU is absent in Ukraine? Uh, and, and why the, the, the Russian aggression uh, towards our neighbours is not faced uh, f f by our uh, defence uh, perception, uh, while only south. Ms. Nirida? Well, my worry would be that where do you draw the line? This is a kind of a stepping stone into a decrease in country sovereignty. I think traditionally countries have been able to defend themselves and it's their right as a sovereign nation to do that and why therefore is this incessant need there that we have to build up this one gigantic block to kind of keep people out um, and throwing more money is really not the solution. We have to be looking at global structures, we have to be looking at land acts, we have to be looking at all of that of how we can support people and conflict resolution. Now if there was money spent on conflict resolution surely that would have a far better progressive uh, outcome rather than just throwing money at this, which I don't think member states are willing to actually buy into it in either the case because they like their own sovereignty. Okay, well, before we go any further, let's look at the current uh, common defence uh, measures and missions that are put in place. Anias Gerard takes a look. The EU may not yet have an EU army, but it already has a common security and defence policy. 3,049 soldiers are currently deployed on five military operations outside the EU, 
In the Central African Republic, where a peacekeeping mission is still underway, and in Bosnia, where EU troops oversee the implementation of the 1995 Dayton Agreement, which ended the Balkan Wars. The formation, when he moved into the line, a little bit too tight. The EU also has military training programs in Somalia and Mali, and has been involved in a counter-piracy operation off the coast of Somalia since 2008. France has, along with Britain, one of the biggest and best equipped armies in Europe. Its latest foreign interventions include Mali and the Central African Republic. France, however, is no military superpower. Recent budget cuts mean Paris now only spends 1.5% of its GDP on defence. In a post-Brexit union, member states cannot rely solely on France. The EU Commission president says it's time to redefine European defence policy. Together, we must unite to protect our interests. We have taken part in over 30 civilian and military operations since 2003. But without a permanent structure, we're not able to work effectively. We need to establish a unique military headquarters in the European Union. Resources are set to be a major issue. France, Germany, Italy and Spain together account for over 80% of the EU's defence spending. Eastern European countries lag far behind, but their military budgets have increased in the wake of Russia's intervention in Georgia and Ukraine. Coordinating with NATO could also prove difficult. There are fears that a common EU force could interfere with transatlantic military cooperation. Well, we see there already a number of measures in place, a number of missions, notably humanitarian when it's with EU troops. Uh, EU battle groups were formed back in 2007, uh, ready to be deployed. These groups ready to be deployed within 10 days, I think the idea was. It's, it, the idea was that it would move around the EU and it would use national troops if called into question, say, if an emergency broke out and France was holding the rotating of these battle groups, it would have to send people off. It's never been used. Does that mean, uh, Major General, there's no need? Yes, right. Is there? Main question, battle groups are words. For the time being, we train troops, standing forces, but never engaged. This is the main question. If we need, if we want, we expect to have a real European defence. We don't, we have not to rely only on words, but on really assets. It's important to say that besides assets, which should be bigger and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and better, uh, one needs common perception of threats, which we don't have, uh, and we have to, uh, to have a political will to use them. And battle groups, uh, which are sleeping, and uh, Eurocorps, which is underused. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the, the examples that uh, we have uh, instruments, we don't use them, so we have to do something on the political side. There needs to be a political will to be a hard power and, and not only a soft power. But do, we, do you think we're, we're getting to that political will? No, and, and a point that I have made before as well, and I suppose, look, you know, all these threats, and they're obviously very real when we see what happened in France and in Belgium uh, and ISIS. Now, if you have 10,000 people of an army defending somewhere and one of these suicide bombers comes in, no army is going to stop them. So in one sense, how effective would it be? Um, in my view, it again comes down to, yes, the political will, but the political will and leadership in the right way, where we talk to these other, our enemies, if you like, and try and see, can we negotiate some kind of resolution rather why, than just Why this. isn't that happening? I don't know why that isn't happening. It should be happening. We are over pacifistic in Europe. We forget the Latin saying, if you want peace, prepare for war, civis pats and parabellum. Uh, and we are unable to deter the potential threats. Uh, and that's the common knowledge in the headquarters of uh, EU member states, uh, in Strasbourg, in Eurocorps, also in, in the headquarters of NATO. But it is not the common perception of the EU population and uh, political elites, not sufficient at least. I would like to come back on your sen first sentence. When you said Eurocorps was underused, it's not the case. And Eurocorps was engaged uh, in K4. Two times in, in Afghanistan, two in times. Kosovo, not in Afghanistan. Kosovo, in Kosovo, in Kosovo, in Kosovo, in Bosnia too, as such as Euroco, as structure for the K4 or for the S4, as including ISAF, not as commanding, leading the ISAF, but 
as main contributor, main part of the headquarters. This was very used, you why, recall, why but not enough, you say, underused. I would not say underused. Why not in Georgia when Russia invaded? Why not in Ukraine when Russia invaded? Uh, this is another question. Is this, do you think an EU army would be more directly controlled, if you like, from Brussels? Is, would that, is that what people are looking for? Well, a lot has been decided or, or foreseen already in, in 1950, European Defence Community, uh, Plan Plevin, uh, all that was invented in, 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 in 1950. It was uh, voted, uh, it was proposed in 1952, uh, and it was killed by French National Assembly yes. in 54. Yes. Uh, and that's why we're it's back long, uh, 60 years ago. after, more than Since that. Then there's been uh, uh, to the same, it was would be more a provision for having a European army under a common control and command uh, integrated on the corps level. At the same time, in the Lisbon Treaty, does Ireland, for example, not have protocol where you know it could veto this? I mean, or is this all hot air talk? Because at the same time, does it not have to be unanimous among EU countries to have a common EU army? Well, yes, it would, and I would hope that Ireland would use the, the power that we have, um, precisely because we have stood for our sovereignty and for our neutrality for many, many years, that we would have that voice. I would also like to, I suppose, point out one of the main things I think that's moving this is the whole fact of Brexit. That has extraordinary implications and, and ramifications right across from an economic to the whole military defence policy as well, because now that England has gone out, Maybe the EU is thinking, well, one of the main opposers and the biggest, one of the biggest contributors, we, unite on. uh, we can now push them to one side and drive on with this project. So we have to be very, very vigilant. And those smaller countries like Ireland particularly are in danger of getting lost in this and kind of get caught up with the tide and not be given that voice that we need. OK, well, thanks to all our guests for having taken part in this edition of Talking Europe. Of course, defence security, one of the main preoccupations of EU citizens, but another major crisis is still uh, being struggled to be dealt with on an EU level. It's the migration, the refugee crisis. Join us after the news. Well, we'll be talking to the Commissioner for Migration and Home Affairs to find out what he thinks.